I am so excited to introduce our next speaker, Julian Eichert, who is a researcher at the Vienna University of Technology and will talk about the super relevant topic of digital humanism, which is a movement that she co-started actually and has gained such traction and momentum lately internationally that I'm just so excited to welcome her. So without further ado, Julia, welcome. The stage is yours. Uh, hello. So, yes. Can you hear me? No. Okay. You can't hear me, right? Oh, I can hear you well. Oh, you can hear me. Okay, because I did not hear anything for a moment. Okay, then uh, let's start. So thank you very much for inviting me to present um, yeah, this, this initiative. Um, I will now start sharing my screen. Yes, I'm feeling very honored to um, talk at this uh, very important conference and thank you for the interesting um, yeah, uh, introduction also to, to these other initiatives. And um, so, yes, I'm, I'm talking about digital humanism as it was already announced, so I'm referring here to uh, initiative where Theo Wien is a driving force and um, it thinks, I think it's very relevant um, also to, to what was said um, about responsible AI and, and, and responsible data science. And so first, uh, although I was already introduced, uh, still some, some um, uh, facts about me. So I have a background in mathematics and computer science. I'm a researcher uh, at Theo Wien, yeah, at the, at the uh, Faculty of Informatics. So um, I'm doing research in data science, mainly uh, recommender systems, but also research um, in uh, online social media. So we're um, yeah, using social network analysis, machine learning, natural language processing. Uh, yeah, I'm also a guest researcher at the Austrian Academy of Sciences and was regularly uh, visiting scholar at Northwestern University. Furthermore, I'm currently on maternity leave, so but uh, my little daughter is helping me wherever <laughs> it's possible. So, um, and about um, uh, this initiative, I want to introduce so some some motivation. In general, some uh, words about uh, informatics. So what we can observe during the last years is that the digital transformation shows how important informatics is for our society. So it's important for innovation, growth and wealth, and it has an impact uh, on almost everything. Um, then it's kind of a foundational um, science. So it develops, or in computer science, informatics, we develop methods and artifacts. And then there was a, a big uh, transformation during the last decade. So first we started with small personal computers, but now we have kind of a, a global machine where computer science is, is running, yeah, the, the, the whole um, world, the whole society. And it's very interesting. So uh, everything that is touched by software can become a computer kind of, if you think in, on the inter uh, internet of things. So now today really everything can be regarded as So there is a, a lot of, of, of chances and a lot of opportunities. Um, however, it's a bit uh, ambiguous. So, um, just take the example of artificial intelligence or machine learning where everybody's talking about today. So it's automating a lot of things like also work and decision making. And we constantly have a discussion between utopia and dystopia. And um, so neural networks uh, are now uh, it's a rather hype uh, about them and um, there is the famous saying about from uh, of Roy Amara, who was um, president of the uh, Institute for the Future. 
So he had this law where he said, we tend to overestimate the effects of a technology in the short run and underestimate it in the long run. So, and we still, uh, yeah, can can relate this to this discussion now about about this, this artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence so has been has had a lot of hypes already since the 1950s um, but in in between so it was forgotten again however the current boom um, is related to two different um, aspects that we have now. So we have now more processing power, we have computer memory, and also we have the available and accessible data. So, but, but we are in this process. And um, yeah, but there are a lot of, of chances. Um, and on the other hand, uh, with computer science, this, this, this rapid development has also its downsides. So if we look at the web, uh, today, uh, it's a, a global mega system where we have a kind of monopoly. But in the beginning, there was the vision of the freedom of information and um, that uh, should uh, be uh, participatory for everybody. But um, it led now to an advertisement based business mod model and as I already said, like monopoly like structures and it's not free, so the users pay with the data. And so the, the founders of the web, like uh, Tim Berners-Lee, he was already stating in a Guardian article um, three years ago, the system is failing. And also other pioneers of the internet uh, kind of are uh, disillusionized today. So like uh, also uh, this, this saying, the internet apologizes. Um, so there are a lot of, of, of issues. Um, I will now uh, just mention some other issues. Um, we have this discussion about this automated decision making, uh, where there are lots of legal and ethical issues involved. Then this automation and work, so it has an impact on, on the job market. So, so it's, it's a question how yeah, this, this will develop. Then this uh, question about data protection and uh, privacy. Um, so the web has a, a, a huge impact on these. Also, I mean, uh, not only uh, private companies, but also for government agencies. Then um, we have the discussion from echo chambers and fake news. Um, where, of course, there is now the aim to, to, to make algorithms that kind of account for these, that, that these, these uh, phenomena do not occur. But I mean, it's also a so political discussion because um, maybe uh, in some, um, now we have the election in the US again. So maybe sometimes this, this fake news really help some, some politicians and, and it's uh, also used on purpose. So it's not that easy that it's just a technical uh, problem that can be resolved. So then also we have this, this platform economy today where a few online platforms dominate the market. Um, so then the last thing I would like to just uh, talk about uh, about in a bit more detail. Uh, it's about personalization and recommender systems, which are also held responsible to some extent for the, for the echo chambers and filter bubbles. Um, so this personalization, so since we have the information overload, so they are absolutely required. And we also find uh, it everywhere on the web. However, uh, um, it's already uh, the case that you uh, can, can learn a lot about the users and even about their personality. So there is this, uh, the way to, 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 to uh, get to know the user personality in a rather implicit way already so that you do not even have to ask them uh, questions or to fill in a questionnaire, but you can just look at user behavior and user generated uh, content and like this it's possible to gain deep knowledge about the user and as I said also about their personality traits so which are the same as big five this openness to experience uh, conscientiousness extraversion agreeableness and neuroticism 
And so research shows that you, if you look at things uh, like the, the Twitter posts of users or their social media behavior on Facebook or how they play games or, um, or also um, if you look on the, the, the behavior, how they, they, they use their mobile phone or even things like which pictures they select or which uh, stories uh, they select. So there was a study where they, they had to select stereotypical stories. You can tell a lot about the, the personality of a person and you can use it uh, within recommender systems and for personalization, which is of course, um, on the one hand, an advantage because you can build better user models, but it's of course very, very critical. Uh, because there is a high danger of misuse. So if you remember this whole discussion about Cambridge Analytica uh, in the last U US elections. So, um, so the question is now which way to go? So here there are two representative books. We have on the one hand, uh, there is uh, one book about the fourth industrial revolution where the, the, the opportunities are kind of shown in a rather positive way. On the other hand, we have um, the surveillance capitalism where it's more about the, the downsides. So the question is, yeah, so we are kind of, of, of in between and we are at the crossroads. And since we are from um, computer science department and Theo Bean, so what we were doing, we were, it was uh, it's now, uh, in April 2019, so a bit uh, more than a year ago, we were um, organizing this Vienna workshop on digital humanism. Um, so this, this, this term digital humanism, so it was not um, us who kind of uh, came up with it. Uh, so it's uh, kind of stems from uh, Julian Niederrümmelin, who is a yeah, philosopher, he was a politician in, in Germany, and he's now in Munich at the university, so he had this book uh, published. And this is a reference to humanism and enlightenment, according to which people are responsible for themselves, use their own thinking and take, take center stage. But for us, um, so this digital humanism, it's an approach that describes, analyzes, and uh, above all, tries to influence the complex interplay between technology and humanity um, for a society that fully respects uh, universal human rights. So, and this workshop uh, was a, a interdisciplinary one. So we had speakers from, um, yeah, these, these different disciplines that are listed here. So not only informatics, but really also philosophy, then history, law, but also economics, uh, political science, uh, mathematics, sociology. We had uh, more than 100 participants, so it was limited also that there uh, uh, could be a lot of interaction and discussion. And we had three main sessions. So there was history and impact of information technology, then humans and society, AI and ethics, and dynamics of a new world, issues and answers. Um, yeah, so the presentations are still available. So and this was uh, then the, the picture. So um, yeah, unfortunately, we cannot gather like this today, but now all these things are virtual, but still back then. So we had really this, this physical meeting, which of course was, was very um, beneficial for, have, for having discussions and then and, and the exchange of ideas. However, we will also try to have it now online today. Um, so the main outcome of this, this um, workshop was the Vienna Manifesto on Digital Humanism. And we see this manifesto and it um, addresses uh, like decision makers uh, and scientists. Uh, and we also see this research program. And so the, the core idea is uh, of this, this manifesto and this digital humanism is that we should shape technologies in accordance with human values and needs instead of letting technologies shape us. And so I just want to list some core principles. So one very important one is that digital technologies should be designed to promote democracy and inclusion. Um, yeah, fairness, responsibility, and 
transparency of software programs and algorithms. Then, yeah, we call for an action intervention against tech monopolies. Then also decisions affecting human rights must, made, must be made by humans. Um, so we think it's essential that uh, different scientific disciplines should work together and should be connected. Then universities, so we only see universities as a, uh, in a special role because in universities new knowledge is created and uh, critical thinking is enhanced. So we have a particular responsibility. And uh, so researchers both from academ academia and industry must maintain an open dialogue with society. And yeah, so we also think that at, at, at uh, academia, we need to combine humanities, social sciences and engineering. Um, so the impact of the Fed manifesto, we had almost 1000 signatures or by, by now we almost have 1000 signatures and we have already seven language uh, versions. So this initiative was also supported or it was in collaboration with the city of Vienna and the WWTF. And both of these institutions have launched research programs. So we had in 2019, there was a call by the city of Vienna where they provided a few hundred thousand euros for project dedicated to digital humanism. Um, uh, and uh, so nine projects were funded. I also received uh, one project out of these nine. And what we are doing there, we are looking at um, news media and want to develop a tool that helps people to, to, to show uh, how different media um, maybe have a tendency to, to write uh, about different politicians. So either they write very positive or very negative and to observe it over time and um, give, give, uh, provide a tool where you compare it. So um, yeah, and this year there was the call so uh, from the VVTF, from the Vienna uh, yeah, Science and Development Fund. So where now even a few million uh, euros are provided. So that is, uh, is now under evaluation. But yeah, so it's, it's, it's uh, there, there is also the political uh, will to put these things uh, into action and to, to, to fund research. Then the manifesto, this was a, um, another story, so it was featured in a Greek newspaper because one of the co-authors was from, from Greece and, and yeah, so he had some connections there and, and there was an article in this, this, this uh, major Greek newspaper and as a consequence, um, they also had it for the university entry exam last year in September. So all the students uh, in, who, who started a university study in, in Greece had to, to uh, answer some questions about this article and about the manifesto. So it's uh, very nice. Then um, uh, just uh, some newer initiatives. So this year we also wanted to have another workshop, but then uh, so a physical one, but then we did, uh, due to COVID-19, uh, we had a virtual workshop in May. And um, it's very interesting because this whole uh, coronavirus shows that uh, informatics and IT really provide the basic infrastructure uh, now also to keep the world going. So if you think about home office, this, this uh, distance learning, also now how we do the conference, so without IT and this whole infrastructure, it would not be possible. Um, and computers are not only kind of the infrastructure, but it's also essential in the current research related to coronavirus um, issues. Like uh, if we predict how the virus spread or also when other things are evaluated. So it's, it's really in a lot of areas, it's, it's, it's fundamental. Um, yeah, so and it was very interesting that this coronavirus brought us completely into the online world within a few days. So, um, and it can be regarded as a, a real experiment, so a digital transformation of our society within a very short time. But it has a lot of political, ethical and social dimensions and here a lot of questions arise. 
that can be related to this digital humanism, of course, again. So um, in, this, in this workshop, we were discussing these things and we are still uh, continuing to discussing these things. So we have online lectures since June, uh, every two weeks where we dis discuss uh, different aspects of digital humanism. So the next sessions are next week on October 6th, where we have a kind of a panel discussion. And then on October 20, um, yeah, so there is, there is uh, so we have really this, this, this period of, of every two weeks. So the last two talks were very interesting. So um, it's um, in September. So there was on the one hand, um, uh, Professor Gross from Harvard. Uh, so she was talking about uh, well, presenting their program at Harvard where they really have uh, ethics embedded in, in, in the computer science curricula. So, and um, the other talk was uh, Stuart Russell who was uh, giving uh, some or overview, overview talk about, about his work where they want to uh, not to destroy the world with artificial intelligence. So, um, so you see, we have a, a lot of, of, of uh, resources already and uh, they can all be retrieved. So we have this platform where you can read the manifesto and also support it. Then um, you can see which current events are planned. And we have also this archive where the slides are available. But there is also the YouTube channel where all the things I was talking about so um, also can be um, watched. Uh, yeah, we have the videos of all the events. And so, but this is in German, so there is a very recent article uh, of uh, Professor Hannes Wertner, uh, who kind of was, was, was characterizing these main ideas and, and also it was now published. Um, in this uh, yeah, book. So uh, yeah, that's uh, my last slide. So uh, the conclusions, um, so technology is not magic. It does not come from nowhere. So, but it reflects specific interests and points of views. And uh, we need to understand it and to reflect it, but we uh, must activate, activ participate and in creating this, this technology. And doing research in this field also implies a specific responsibility. So as I already said, we are at the crossroads. So and it's up to us now which way to go. And so just the very last thing we have here. Um, also, there was already from 1969 an article by uh, Popa, so who uh, was was writing about the moral responsibility of the scientists. It's um, yeah, it's an interesting text to read. So um, thank you. Um, here again the link to the platform. So and in the in the end, so I was uh, asked to also uh, pose a question to the audience. And my question would be, so like looking at the manifesto and, and, and the principles that are presented there. So the question is to all of us, how to put this into action? So which things uh, can, we, can we put into action? How can we realize uh, these ideas where it's clear that something has to be done, but it's not so easy really how to tackle these issues? So thank you very much. Thank you, Julia, for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Um, I think the importance of this initiative cannot be overstated. It has just become more obvious now in the current crisis how important this is. So I strongly encourage everyone to check out the manifesto. We have just posted the link in the chat. You can go there, read more about it, find out more, sign it, and of course also attend one of their future events. So in the meantime, we have a few questions from the participants. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is if we have, if you are aware of a blacklist of companies that should be avoided, I'm assuming because of um, bad data science practices. No, I mean, 
uh, we we do not we do not have a blacklist in that sense. But I really uh, have to to say that at the at the workshops that we had, uh, like already the physical one last year, and then um, also some of these online events. So we were really talking a lot about the big tech companies. <laughs> so so like uh, Google, Facebook which actually so it's very hard to avoid them in in real life so this this is this, exactly. this, this is this dilemma really but um yeah so but there were a lot of uh yeah in discussion but but really they're the big one so yeah yeah the usual suspects that cannot be avoided so easily unfortunately yeah so it's it's and but but what what we are I mean the, one of the things that I mentioned was also ethics and ethics is very important because it's um, yeah it should be kind of uh, guiding uh, the work in data science this becomes more and more clear that this is a, a core issue but um, we would also go beyond ethics so we would say ethics is responsible of the single individual but um, what we are also asking for is kind of a societal um, solutions like political regulation and there should also be political measures and 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 so this is this is so even go beyond uh, ethic of the individual exactly exactly that's probably not enough yeah so we need to set wide measures uh, i know you're pressed on time so maybe just one or two more questions uh the next question with most likes is if um in your experience, competitive events such as hackathons are helpful or rather harmful for the field? So, well, it's probably difficult to say. I mean, the, the, I think so uh, to the field in general, like uh, I have positive experiences with, with hackathons. So I think it, it shows. Uh, it fosters a bit kind of also people working together and and um i think so it's it's sometimes or what i was often surprised is the creativity that that then uh kind of takes place in a very short time to come up with with very interesting solutions so yeah no i, I actually uh, but the the hackathons where I was in the jury or I was participating it were all more academia related so it yeah I think it it was also sometimes we had this a topic also uh, um, so like last year um, I'm doing a lot of work in in in, in tourism also so like recommender systems in tourism and then we had a, a hackathon for responsible tourism it was together with some data it was uh, kind of very positive actually so 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 we were discussing a lot of uh, societal issues also related to this which i would not have thought about so by myself so it was, it was quite of so but this is my my own ex experience so maybe um, yeah i mean i would also agree yeah. i would also assume that it has a rather help it's rather helpful and it has a rather positive impact because it raises awareness nothing else so maybe one last question if it's okay with you if you have time for one more question mm -hmm. okay well um, we have an interesting question it's about evolutionary theory and um, the person is asking uh, what importance does evolutionary theory and the concept of social complexity have in your research? This is an interesting question. Yeah. I, I do not know exactly what uh, evolutionary theory, I mean, it, it reminds me, um, so we have uh, in, in um, in our initiative so we are, we are with this digital humanism that i'm talking about so there is um also uh one of the um, in there who is also in this in this board is is, is uh, at uh, at least so and he had this book of the co-evolution of of humans and machines and he's using a lot of evolutionary theory to argue that uh 
that we see kind of also how how technology develops so that 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 it's kind of an evolution it's not just you know this this these sharp uh, steps but 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 we have this this also how software programs he would he would um call it kind of that this is a process and he finds parallels when looking at the evolution and he argues that that this this coexistence of of of, of technology and and, and and humans he also sees this in this context of a co-evolution so but i do not know whether this is meant but it it, it still i would uh, recommend his book i will put it in the chat here so yes if, please. If, if, yeah. so it's a very very inspiring book and uh, he also gave some talks, um, which can be uh, kind of, uh, yeah, you can watch the videos at this Dikum channel that, that I posted. Oh, definitely there. check it out. So, yes, thank you for the recommendation. In my, in my, in my research, like, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah, so not directly using I mean, there is this, this algorithms that, 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 that have uh, kind of this, this um, yeah, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. But Thank I would you. post the link to, to, to Yes, definitely. We will check it out. Mm -hmm. can, we, can we have one more question? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, what is the one thing that has been most important for you personally that has come from women in tech events? The one thing that has been so um, for me, I was um, I was studying mathematics, uh, yeah. So before go going to computer science, and back then I already appreciated uh, this this uh, female events in STEM. So there was a, a conference that was taking place yearly. Uh, in, in for German region and we were always organizing because I was um, yeah at the, at the faculty of, of mathematics I was also co-responsible for for uh, supporting the, the program to support women and we were always organizing kind of a year a yearly trip to this to this conference for women in STEM so I had a, a lot of uh, benefits from attending these events so Really, so it's, it's, it. I would say that um, it, it had an impact on, on kind of my, my whole research and my whole career. So this is, this is yeah. Awesome. Uh, so we'll make was, sure. Yeah. yeah, kind of a very different atmosphere there. And I really learned, um, yeah, that, that, that women can have, uh, so can be in, in each role, in every role that, 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 um, yeah, science uh, can offer stuff so like this. Yeah, that's great. We will make sure to organize more future events like this, since obviously they have a positive yeah. impact. Thank you for the initiative, by the way. So, I mean, yeah. Thank you for being here. Uh, we don't want to take any more of your time. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing and for posting the links. Again, I strongly encourage anyone to check out the manifesto and sign it and hope to see you soon at another event. Now, uh, we're all clapping here. You cannot Thank see you. us. <laughs> we're all clapping here. Big applause for Julia Neidhardt. Now we have a few general questions um, that um, we can answer. Um, maybe Rania can answer some of them. All right. Um, I will try to answer questions here. Um, which ones have we not answered yet? Um, well, um, I think that you, 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 oops. Uh, did you answer them? Okay, the in the party. Okay. Um, no, I do not have a blacklist of companies. That was quick. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to. 
uh, do I think that having these events in English excludes people? Um, well, actually, we hold the events in English uh, in order to include people. Uh, the data science community in, in Vienna certainly is international, and there are people coming from um, um, many countries. Uh, not all of them speak German. Uh, so in order to allow these people to uh, attend our events as well, we tend to have them in English. Uh, the other uh, thing is, uh, I have actually tried and written a book on data science in German, and believe me, it is a real pain. <laughs> um, because most of the terms are just in English. They were made in English and trying to translate everything and say it in German uh, is a huge effort and even uh, German speakers don't know what you're talking about then because the terms are known under their English names. So in general, uh, I think actually um, data science to make it as open as possible, um, we hold, uh, certainly in the Vienna Data Science Group, we hold our talks in English, but uh, there are events uh, where data topics are discussed in German. Um, I can think of the ADV conference, uh, perhaps Brigitte Lutz, who will be our next speaker, she will uh, talk about that, um, and, and their talks tend to be in German. Um, the second point is if there is demand for having data science talks in German, uh, let us know and we can always arrange one. So, um, I think that's it. So, Joanna? Another question that a lot of people were interested in uh, was, um, if having experience in data science is a prerequisite to join the community. And I can say no, because personally, I also don't have experience in data science. I actually studied finance, which is completely unrelated and currently work in e-commerce. But I just really believe that data science is affecting the lives of everyone and is practically affecting all industries. So everyone is welcome to join that is interested. And maybe in the future, we will also do some workshops with the Vienna Data Science Group and Women in AI. And um, I see there were more questions, but I think now it's a good time to take a break and we will answer them later. We'll take like a 10 minute break. Please stay tuned because we are having some great talks for you after the break. Yeah, if you have any questions, just post them in the chat and we'll see you in 10 minutes. 